are coming to a temporary pause in our conversation around the book of Acts. Um, we have been walking our way through the Acts of the Apostles, an incredible account of about the first 60 years of the early church. As an historian, I love reading it. As a theologian, I love reading it. As a human being, I love reading what happened in those early days when they didn't have a Bible, they had the Torah, but the Gentile Christians had nothing. They ended up having a few letters written. And uh, how did they stumble and stutter their way into literally a global transforming movement? All in but 400 years, actually. And so we have just been piecing together the jigsaw puzzle that tells this early story that inspires us to believe actually we can be a transforming agent in the world in which we live. I know you don't really believe that. You wonder if little old you could be a transforming human being. Uh, the truth is you can. And part of the wonder of the story is the truly supernatural nature of that. And uh, we've anchored in there. We haven't rushed. We've taught some, then we've rested, then we've taught some more because we want to get into this. Can I say one more thing? I know there's a lot of deconstruction of the need for teachers. Yeah, I have church. I go and have a beer with Christian friends of mine. No, that's not church. Church, by any definition of the Scripture, is way more compelling and way more sacrificial and way more service-orientated and generous and kind than a friend having a beer with a friend at the pub. Far more compelling in the Scriptures. But you say, Chris, I don't remember what you preached by Monday night. So why do it? Well, it's a double-edged sword. The one is instruction, which is mental transformation. Your mind is being chased, changed as is mine. Uh, I don't know how many hours a week I and the others who teach us spend preparing and shaping ourselves through the text and the power, the supernatural. This is not equivalent to a Shakespearean sonnet. This is life transforming. But not just instruction, there's impartation, and that's to the soul. That's different to instruction that comes to the mind. There's impartation that stirs you. Um, and a lot of that happens where Paul said, listen, don't neglect even reading the Scriptures. You think, really? Do I have to, read, do I have to hear the leper story again? Yes, you do. Because there's impartation that happens that stirs our hearts for the fight which is at hand. And so this evening, I'm going to land us where, uh, as a kind of a part B to Ty. I thought Ty was outstanding last Sunday. I absolutely loved it. If you missed it, it's online. I thought the way in which he managed the text uh, was just superb. But I couldn't shake this little verse. So let me read from the CEB. Um, which is a translation. Oh, well, that's going to be interesting. Okay, they entered Antioch. It's Acts chapter 11, and it's from verse 20. And I drew up those slides, so I was that brilliant. You don't know, you don't know how long it took me to get that right. You think it's a mistake. They entered Antioch and began to proclaim the good news about the Lord Jesus also to the Gentiles. And the Lord's power was with them. So who are these people? These are people just like you. They were refugees. The Roman authority of the day and the Jewish authorities of the day collaborated together and the Christians were scattered. Think of the refugees. Think of Syria, Afghanistan. Think of what's happening throughout Europe right now with refugees pouring into all of those nations. That was them. They had to leave everything. They had to leave their homes. They had to leave their goods, their, their treasures. They had to literally take what they could carry and they didn't have suitcases so they had to sling a handful of jackets and garments and some food for the road as they ran away from the fear of being slaughtered, martyred. They of those people. And when the church in Jerusalem heard about this, there were a large number of people coming to the faith. They sent Barnabas. Well, what is Bar who's Barnabas? He was just a guy from Cyprus 
who was so excited when he saw what God did in Jerusalem that he sold some land and he gave it to the apostles. It said he, la- he laid it at the apostles' feet. His name was Joseph, actually. But in keeping with the joy of early Christian community, they said, dude, you are such an encouragement. We're going to change your name from Joseph. We're going to call you Barnabas from now on, but you are the son of encouragement. So they hear these stories about this young, fragile, early church. People have just come to faith. They didn't go to Christian schools, Christian preschools. Their mom didn't read new, uh, at least Christian little uh, kiddie stories to them. They didn't go to Christian high schools or Christian colleges. They were like hot off the press newbies. So Barnabas arrives there. Where am I? When he arrived and saw the evidence of God's grace. Oh, I know that's what happened. I highlighted that. And the screen highlighted it more. (laughs) So now I guess you see what I'm trying to say. When he arrived and saw the evidence of God's grace. See, I knew there was a reason. He was overjoyed and encouraged everyone to remain truly committed to the Lord. Barnabas responded in this way because he was a good man whom the Holy Spirit endowed with exceptional faith and a considerable number of people were added to the Lord. Barnabas went to Tarsus and tied to such a great job telling us how long it would take uh, Barnabas from Jerusalem to Antioch, then to back to Tarsus. What was that, like 200 miles or something? So around it was 400 miles that he walked. You know how compelling that is? I mean, would you walk 200 miles to find a buddy? You're like, they haven't texted me back. I'm done. I ain't doing this no more. I mean, he walked. Now what happens, I thought to myself, if Paul wasn't a Tarsus, what would he do then? Oh, sorry. You want, that Paul? Oh, no, actually he went to Ephesus. Would you mind just walking another 100 miles to Ephesus? I mean, this blows your mind. What was so compelling about this message and this whole Christian thing that got them to walk two weeks to find someone, to take that someone to a brand new church that was stuttering and stumbling its way through? I'm just so, you think I'm radical? You think I'm a passionate guy who preaches and the blood vessels in my my frow, my my, whatever you call it, um, neck and... Forward, Frau. I wish that was even the Afrikaans word, then that would sound good. All right, here we go. Barnabas went to Tarsus 200 miles to search for Saul. He found him. He brought him to Antioch and they were there for a whole year meeting with the church and teaching large numbers of people. It was in Antioch where the disciples were first labeled Christians. Evidence of God's grace. Now, obviously, your mind has to jump like mine and ask yourself, what did he see? What did he discern? He walks in and there's the evidence of God's grace. Oh, my word. (laughs) We are in for a fun time because I I did 28 slides. So we're in for a fun time. (laughs) And I was so impressed with me. God has God has a great way to humble the proud. Eh? I, I was going to strut my stuff, walk my way through, say, Ty, I just want you to see that's how you do slides, and it's not. Okay, just before we present that text, please. I'll tell you when to go there. All right, so here we go. What on earth did Barnabas see is the question we have to ask. What did he discern? What did he sense? What did a new Jesus community look like? In fact, the people in the city, Costa Mesa called Genesis Christians. It was so obvious that they've got a rabbi called Jesus and that they looked like that rabbi, walked like that rabbi, talked like that rabbi, acted like that rabbi. Man, it was an incredible thing. So I did a deep dive into it this week and I knew I was in trouble when there were 118 passages in the New Testament that dealt with grace. I knew I was in trouble. So I went and I said, okay, let's trim it down to eight points. And I thought, I can do eight points. Then I started realizing, you know, it's not going to work eight. So let's do four. And your kindness, I'm going to do two. Thank you, Dana. Two, two evidences 
of God's grace. We had a crazy day yesterday. Yesterday morning, we went to a funeral in LA. And it sounds like a movie because we had a funeral in the morning in LA and a wedding in the afternoon in Fullerton. They make movies about moments like that. But what was truly memorable, and there were many memorable moments at the funeral, was uh, that everyone who spoke, I think there were about seven people who spoke, were sublime. This was a remarkable woman. Susie was her name. She died prematurely at 58, 59, 1967, whatever the age was. Mother, a wife, a grandma, loved in the community. Her husband pastored the church that we had this memorial in. But that wasn't only the evidence of grace. But if I was to ask, what was the evidence of God's grace there that really caught my attention? And here it was. Right at the end, as is commonplace these days, what they did was they showed a video. But Sorry, slides video thing. It wasn't normal. You know what happens at, at funerals normally? You go back and there's a picture of them as a baby and everyone goes, oh, how amazing. And then you see them, whatever, their first date and everyone goes, aha, you know. And it goes all the way through and it's beautiful. Except what they did is they documented the story from the day Jeff and Susie heard she had cancer. And initially I was quite taken, quite honestly. I thought, wow, that's different. That's new. And they took us through 10, 15 minutes of the story, her quotes. I think it was called Words in Red because his nickname for her was Red. And it was incredible. And from that moment of the sheer shock and horror, she had cancer and the, 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 the synoptist wasn't good. All the way through to the final time he lay with her on the bed and she died that night as I remember it. And he said to her, you are not going to die. I thought, gee, that's a lot of faith going on there. You know, are you saying, and he said, no. He said, you're going to open, close your eyes. And when you open your eyes, you're going to be at home with Jesus. And I was like, wow, okay. And he said, he lay next to her and he said, remember when we had little kids and we went out for dinner and we put them to sleep at a friend's house. And then what happens was that we would pick them up and take them home. And the next morning they went to sleep at a friend's house, but they woke up in their own beds. He said to her, tomorrow you are waking up in your true home and you will be with Jesus. All of us were weeping. Now, the evidence of God's grace was not just the beauty of that moment, but it's the grace to tackle cancer and death. It wasn't trauma, although it was deeply moving. It wasn't, why did she have to die, oh God? How unfair, who do you think you are, God? Why do you do things like that? Susie, remember when we put the kids to sleep in another house and we picked them up and we put them and they woke up the next morning, that Susie, it's what's gonna happen. And wait, because I'm coming to join you. Ladies and gentlemen, that for me is the evidence of grace. It has no evidence of a world that's confused with cancer, with death. It was the beauty of a family soaked and saturated by the wonder and marvel of who Jesus truly is and how you apply the gospel into your life on a day-to-day -day basis. We think differently, we act differently, we speak differently. Scenario number two. We dashed home, I went to traders, that's not gonna change your life, and then we went to the wedding. The wedding was beautiful, it was in Fullerton, and uh, there was a moment, the evidence of God's grace, there was a moment in the ceremony. His father is a professor at Yale or Princeton. Yeah. Yale. And he's a pastor and he heads up the evangelical initiative. So he's steeped in all of this. But there was a moment where he asked the bride's parents to stand up. And they did. And he, and it was obviously pre-planned, and he asked them words to the effect of, I don't want to butcher the moment, love, but effectively, would you stand up and publicly acknowledge that you accept Shannon's parents, Tristan, as your son? And they publicly affirmed him being welcomed into the family as a covenant member. Then he and his wife stood, so to speak, and welcomed Shannon into their family accepting her fully as a daughter and then ask the congregation to stand. Sorry, my love. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. Do you want to say that? 
You said it really nicely. <laughs> and basically release them to carve their own future, not leaving the hooks of parents and in-laws that, you know, you owe us, you got to do this. Every Thursday night we together, you better be there. None of that manipulation. We want to release you. Go and live your life. And then ask the congregation to stand. And we, the congregation, were asked, would we, and again, my word's not his, effectively pray for them, stand with them, lift up their arms, uh, empower this journey. It was a moment of great grace. I sat there thinking, if I did not know Jesus, this would be a moment that would have deep impact on my life. It was the evidence of God's grace. This wasn't just, let's crunch out you know, let's get another wedding behind us so we can get drunk and party. This was a moment of deep covenant where the grace of God was being lived out by men and women standing together before God and each other and saying, so be it. This is what we believe to be Bible and true. Now, grace is not an idea or a principle. Now, I'm sorry about the text because they really are Beautiful ones, and I thought I would highlight them, and that messed the whole thing up. But Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it reads, For the grace of God has appeared. Grace is not a principle or an idea, it's a person. It's Jesus. When the grace of God appeared, He was incarnated in human form bringing salvation for all people, what this grace did is two things. It's training us to renounce ungodliness. Sorry it's so bad. I do apologize, man. I won't be that clever next time. It trains us to renounce ungodliness. This grace, when it appeared, which is Jesus, trains us to renounce ungodliness and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. You see the outcry about the Olympics opening ceremony and how they butchered with heresy the Lord's, the table, the disciples, and the global outcry. This is the present age we live in. This is not a present age where Christendom is honored and respected as a global faith. It is a time where they would not do that to Muslims. They would not do that to Hindus. They would not do that to atheists or those who are driven by other ideologies. We are the punching bag of the world. And we have to embrace that. And there's grace to embrace that. Where we don't become angry and bitter and resentful and the world is against us. We view it a privilege that our worship, our Jesus, our, the Son of God came and dwelt amongst us. That we can dwell amongst others in this grace. That He trained us to say no to ungodliness and to live self-controlled life. Verse 14, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people of his own. Redeem and purify. Notice those, we're coming back to those in just a moment. And then John chapter one, verses 16 and 17, it speaks about grace upon grace and grace and truth. Now, let's pause and catch our breath for just a moment. What is this grace? Well, we know it's Jesus. We know it's evidenced in his life, but... There are three little phrases I would love you to get. And if you can't get the phrases, get the primary word in each phrase. Here we go. Next slide. There we go. Jesus gives us three essential pieces. One, this grace is undeserved mercy. Have you thought of the woman at the well? Jesus is in Samaria. The Samarians hate the Jews. The Jews hate them. He's there in the heat of the day and he meets a woman. He's by himself. And a woman who is there in the heat of the day, and most of you know the story, she shouldn't have been there. The heat of the day meant you are ostracized by the other woman. It means that they gossip about you, talk about you, humor you, belittle you, alienate you, isolate you. And he sits at the well as if to await her. They had an appointment in a divine diary. And he says to her, woman, where's your husband? And she says, I don't have one. He says, I know. He says, you've had four. And the one you're living with right now, he could have said, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. Look who you're sleeping with, just another guy. You are a whore. The Bible uses that word, but not of her. 
Jesus extends mercy to her. Now, I don't know what your story is like, but I know I don't deserve mercy. I know that this angry, bitter young man did not deserve mercy when Jesus came and found me. I didn't deserve it. I was angry. I mean, honestly, and I'm not trying to exaggerate my story, but I remember wanting to cuss more than everyone else. I was so angry and bitter on the inside that I would F-bomb and the equivalent to my day as much as I could because I wanted people to respect me because I was an asshole. But Jesus extended mercy to me. I didn't deserve it. I didn't want him. See, grace is Jesus coming in mercy saying, Chris, I know you don't deserve this. But this, is, this is what I bring. The second piece in that is unmerited favor. An unmerited favor is Zacchaeus who cheated his people out of their taxes. He was, they were hated. Done fairly well in the chosen. But before thousands of people, when he's the isolated, alienated one once again, Jesus calls him out in front of everyone. He doesn't sidle up to him and kind of say, Shh, talk to me after the meeting. He says, Zacchaeus, come down. Come down. Tonight, I'm eating at your house. Favor. The ultimate favor. So mercy was the woman at the well. Favor was Zacchaeus. I'm eating at your house tonight. And then thirdly, divine empowerment. So it's undeserved mercy. There it is, unmerited favor and divine empowerment. That means God gives me the ability to live a supernatural life. Now, the story that came to my mind while I was just going through this for the nth time today was Simon Peter, who was brash and opinionated and put his foot in his mouth more times than one can remember. And yet when Jesus looked at him, he said, Simon, who, who, who do you say I am? And he said, oh, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah. And he said, our oh, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my father who is in heaven. That is supernatural. He was not an educated man. He wasn't a schooled man. He didn't have fancy language. He was just a fisherman. But God empowered him. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. So when you and I belittle ourselves, play ourselves down, who am I? What am I? I don't deserve all of this. God says, absolutely. Here's my mercy. Here's my favor. And here is my empowerment. Now, two things, and I will try to be as quick as I can. The first, what did Barnabas see? I think he saw beauty. On Tuesday night, we had a, a rather remarkable, next slide, please. There we go. We had a rather remarkable prayer meeting, worship time. You're going to enjoy the time. We take out the chairs. You won't have chairs here next Sunday. We're just going to come in and worship. We'll have some chairs around the edges for those who are not able to sit like if you're about 23. You know, you sit down during worship. So we'll have chairs for some of you who can't stand. But it was an interesting moment because I'm standing there, I'm leading the moment, I'm trying to read what God's on about and I felt something like this. How do you always articulate what you feel? But some of you are living under the weight of ugliness because you've lost your beauty. A moment a person or a word has stripped you of your beauty. A moment, someone looked upon your, maybe, and forgive me for just using some poor examples, someone looked upon your prom gown and kind of giggled and, oh, yeah, she looks pretty fat, doesn't she? No one wanted to take you. A person, a moment, or a word stripped you of your beauty. Pretty convinced you were from that time onwards that you really are ugly. But pa ba Barnabas didn't see that. Do you know what he saw? He saw beauty. Look at this verse. He gave beauty for ashes. 
Isn't that exquisite? That's what it says Jesus would do with his redemption. He would take the ashes of a dissolved life, a life that considers himself or herself to be ugly. And he grants in redemption beauty. Show the next slide, please. What do you see there? Is that Dana's third baby? I don't know, that just slipped out. And no, it's not Dana's third baby, but she is with child. Why did I want to include that? Because that's the reaction, isn't it? When there's new life, there's excitement. There's this, wow, look at that. Can you see the little... Yeah, and, and boy or girl, um, thank you, Meryl, for uh, interpreting that great prophetic moment. What, what? See, see, beauty, we, we know what beauty looks like, but we have no idea what that baby's going to look like. But somehow inside of us, when God created from Genesis 1, we know that beauty was seeded in creation because that little baby might have looked like this. Next slide. See, we are an ooh because we know what beauty looks like. My point here is this, dear friends, is that God in first creation created beauty. And all too often, when we think of redemption and salvation and uh, justification and atonement and ransom, all those big religious words that we don't always fully understand, sometimes we miss the point. And the point is that God wants to make us a new creation where beauty is restored in His eyes and in ours. Where beauty is restored in His eyes as in ours. All at creation, we are very good in His eyes. At our new creation, we are made very beautiful. So I went and looked online. I thought, well, I'm interested. How does the world define beauty? This is what I found. Aristotle. Uh, no, I didn't quote that. Next one. Thanks. There, oh, it's small. Okay. Aristotle said beauty was symmetry. He said philosophically to understand beauty, you've got to understand angles. That's what he said. John Keats, the English poet who died at 25, said, no, no, actually, beauty is truth. If you get truth, you get beauty. Oscar Wilde, in his kind of very sad life, complicated life, said, you must understand beauty is genius. So what happens? If you're not a genius, you obviously are very ugly. Picasso, who had a real lust issue, who slept around prolifically, said, obviously, beauty is dangerous. He could reach no other conclusion, but that beauty is dangerous. Coco Chanel, who arguably shaped the fashion industry from about the 20s, I think it is, said, beauty was self-expression. Ah, oh, that's what it is. I must just express myself. Then I know what beauty really is. Maybe. David Bowie who was more my generation in the 70s, he said, no, 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 beauty was strange. You've got to be weird. You've got to be strange. You've got to dress crazily. You've got to wear weird makeup. You've got to do all sorts of crazy things. That is beauty. Creating the birth to the whole punk rock era and more. Christine Aguilera said, beauty is inside of you. Oh, oh yeah, I'm feeling that. I mean, there isn't a greater lie, but boy, does it feel good. And of course, Miss Piggy said, beauty is worth fighting for. But what must I fight for? What is it I must fight for? Dear friends, beauty, please listen, is not finding yourself. Beauty is not being true to yourself. You're a sinner. Being true to your sinful nature does not make you more beautiful, as we'll see in just a moment. Or beauty is trying to create some external random imaginations. That's just my words of beauty. It's trying to create some external thing. Well, I want to be a bit like Kim Kardashian as it was 10 years ago. Or 30 years ago, Twiggy, this tiny little bitty English girl who had nothing. That we were told was beauty. That we were told was beauty. But then the scripture comes. And the scripture defines beauty exquisitely. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. 
the moment, the person, the word that took your beauty away from you, physically, mentally, emotionally. The Bible invites us into a new story. The old has passed away. The angry, bitter, resentful, cussing, foul-mouthed Chris was invited into a new story where God could restore my beauty once again. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Beauty is becoming like him, dear friends. What did Barnabas see? I don't know when last you were in the presence of someone who got radically saved. I was thinking about it today and my mind was racing. I can't remember her name, love, but there was a, we, we ran, I, when I was still single, I was about 20 years old, I ran a communal house for people who were addicts and whatever. And there was a girl who'd been on the street. She was a prostitute. And uh, I just remember looking at her eyes as she burnt her bikinis, burnt her records, face lit up. Chris, I've been born again. That old me, that's dead. We used to have bonfires, big diesel uh, uh, um, gasoline tanks. And people would bring all the stuff that reminded them of yesteryear and they were burnt up as we rejoiced and danced around the dying of the old and the invitation towards the new. Barnabas saw beauty. I looked at that prostitute. I could not imagine what her life must have been like, but I saw a new creation in Christ. And I could imagine how much heaven rejoiced. Big John had done time in prison for murder. He killed a man on the street. And he would follow me around wherever I went. The man who had literally murdered someone was quiet, gentle, full of joy. He was a new creation in Christ. I said to him one day, John, what is it like? He said, you know, when people ask me to give my testimony, it feels so fraudulent. It feels such a long time ago that I was in prison for murder. That's not me. This is me. I am a new creation in Christ. And the night my father got dramatically saved, forgive me for telling some stories here, radically saved. He fell on his face as an alcoholic and he stood up. He never has not touched a drink since then and it was about the time Dana was born, so that's 36 years ago. His pancreas that was being destroyed and his liver that was shriveling up, restored to full health. And he worked construction. He was a tough man, a very tough man. When his laborers gave him a hard time, he'd hit them. He wasn't verbally tough. He was physically tough. And shortly after that, some of his workers came to put up a fence at our house. And one of them, uh, a young uh, guy, said to Meryl, forgive the South African language, he said, what's happened to Boss Pat? And Meryl said, what do you mean? She said, he said, I don't understand him anymore. He doesn't shout at us. He doesn't hit us. I don't even understand his words because he only knew, this young black guy, only knew construction language. So he F-bombed his way around our, I mean, just, he didn't know another English. Ladies and gentlemen, that is beauty. That is beauty. When old things have passed away, new things have come. When the transformation work of Christ is so dramatic, and I've got that big uh, cylinder, that big uh, diesel thing, whatever, and I throw all the things that are remnants of yesteryear, and I destroy them because behold, new things have come. That's what Barnabas saw. And maybe, I'm telling all of these stories because maybe you are still too attached to the things that remind you of the old you. Maybe these stories are for you to find the new you. The things that don't drag you back all the time as if the old never lost its handle on you. New things have come. Goodness has come. Jesus was kind. He loved. He cared. He forgave. He was merciful. He was generous. He embraced 
hope and courage. Secondly, I'll be much quicker with this one. Thank you for being so gracious. Not only, I think Barnabas saw beauty, but he got, Barnabas saw radiance. I chose this word because two texts. The one is, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Exodus 34, 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with two tablets on the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. Hannah, I don't want to embarrass you, Hannah Clark, but when we came back from our sabbatical, honestly, I looked into Hannah's face and it was radiant. Why? Because she'd been with the Lord. That's what Barnabas saw. He saw the radiance of people who had been with Jesus. Uh, Ephesians 5, 27. And to present her, Jesus says, he will present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle, any other blemish, but holy and blameless. I hate the word purity. And not because it's a bad word, but it's associated with legalism. I was thinking of Josh Harris, such a sad story, wrote a book in the 90s, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, and it's sold like that, sorry? Three, three, how many? 2000, thank you. And um, I mean, it, it was, it, every parent bought the kid that book, Conservative Evangelical. Go, go and read this book, this is good, I've kissed Dating Goodbye. Well, we always know the fruit of truth, except it didn't bring freedom. He ended up divorcing his wife and publicly apologizing for writing the book. That's legalism. Purity can be a dastardly master. Controlling us legally. You can do that, you can't. We make up self-made laws. Your skirt can't be you know, longer than that or shorter than that. Or we, we, we craft these rules and laws as if they were Bible, but they're never life-giving. Look at these two pictures, would you? Do you want to swim in that river? Well, I'm guessing you don't want to swim in that river because of pollution. And my guess when I look at that picture as I scratched around the internet for images, it probably wasn't a number of pickup trucks that just emptied their tonnage into a river. My guess, it was someone threw a can... Another person threw a box. Someone threw a stick or a plastic packet. And pretty soon it accumulated one little thing, you know, had a takeout meal and, ah, oh, what the heck, throw it out the window. The rains come and wash it down to the ocean, to the river and then to the ocean. What difference does my little cup make, my little plastic contribution? Well, would you rather be there or next picture? Would you rather be there? What's the difference? Very simply, pollution. Proverbs 25, 26 says, Like a muddied spring or a polluted well are the righteous who give way to the wicked. A polluted well. Please hear me as a fellow believer, not as the leader of this church or a father, just as a, every time you and I take a can and we scrunch it up and we throw it out the window. Go back to that first picture, please. We are adding to that in our soul. You can argue with me about what is truly moral. You can argue philosophically with me about ethics and what is acceptable. Read Romans chapter one and you can debate with me if you want all those things that are listed as clearly pollution adding pieces to this human soul. But the truth is, none of us want to swim there. And every thought, word, or deed that we offer, that we throw out the window, oh, that's not going to make any difference. That's not going to impact anyone. It's just me. Actually, dear friends, you pollute your soul as do I mine and we end up like that and we wonder why we are spiritually dying. Because we've polluted our soul. James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, 
to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. There it is, highlighted. (laughs) My great slides. Barnabas saw beauty because God makes a new creation. Barnabas saw radiance because he saw people who had been with Jesus who did not pollute their souls. I'm coming into land, I promise. I was speaking to a therapist this week and we were talking about human transformation. And he said to me, you know, Chris, I deal a lot with addicts. And he said, one of the things we teach them is the acronym HALT, H-A-L-T. He said, we warn them that this is when you are at your most vulnerable, they say. H, when you are hungry. A, when you are angry. L, when you are lonely. T, when you are tired. And they say, the therapist says, to those, those are warning signs. In my language, if I can translate that, that's when you're vulnerable to polluting your soul. When you are hungry, when you are angry, when you are lonely, and when you are tired. Now this is not me, it's cleverer people than me who put that on the ground. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Paul writes this and he says, When he, the Lord, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. We know what Paul's um, thorn in the flesh was. People say, well, we don't know what. Of course, it's a messenger from the enemy. He tells us in the previous verse. Satan is gunning for you. When? When you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, when you're tired, the enemy is gunning for you. He's got all systems going. His his foghorn is blaring out loud. You are hungry, you are angry, you are lonely, you are tired, you are freaked out. The enemy says, yes. Ecosystem number one, I got you. Pollution, baby. You know that. I know that. And Paul says, my grace, my mercy, my favor, my divine empowerment is sufficient for you. Spiritual radars up, Uh uh-uh, hungry, angry, lonely. No one loves me. The phone never rings, never any text messages. No one cares about me. All right, computer on. Here we go, porn site. I'm gonna solve this. The enemy says, yeah! My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. When are you weak? When you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, and when you're tired. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Ladies and gentlemen, what did Barnabas see? I think he saw a lot. I've highlighted two things that I think he saw. Beauty and radiance. Beauty and a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Radiance, because I have been with him. And his grace is radiating out of my face because I've tasted mercy, I've tasted favor, and I've tasted empowerment. I will boast all the more of my weaknesses. I want to invite you to the table, but before we do, I want to ask you, thank you, I've preached a little long, I apologize. But I'd like you just to take a moment, just you and the Lord. Make a note. What is God highlighting for you? Is it a verse? Is it a story? Is it a moment? Before we come to the table, before we rush and do our beautiful bread and grape juice, my grace is sufficient for you. Thank you for listening to the Genesis Costa Mesa podcast. 
To find more information about our community, feel free to visit our website, www.genesiscostamesa.com, or find us on social media at Genesis Costa Mesa.